selling the deal. The president plugs the agreement reach with Iran over nuclear development. Open to all. Pope Francis affirms the openness of the church to divorce Catholics who have entered a new union. Musical worship. The papal choir warms up for next month's mass, closing the world meeting of families. And changing perceptions. Chicago cops take to the ball field, hoping to improve community relations. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Wednesday, August 5th, 2015. Good evening from Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your News Now. Defending the nuclear deal reached with Iran, President Obama today echoes the late JFK. Without the deal, Obama says, war is inevitable. Jason Calvey reports from the White House. Brian, the president says if Congress rejects the Iran deal, the only way the U.S. could stop that country from getting the bomb is through war. Today, point by point, the president defended the, the nuclear deal. President Obama speaks today at American University, the same place where President John F. Kennedy called for Cold War diplomacy in 1963. First, examine our attitude towards peace itself. Too many of us think it is impossible. Today, Obama echoed the past and urged peace. The choice we face is ultimately between diplomacy or some form of war. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not three months from now, but soon. The president tackled criticism, like the fact it may take 24 days for inspectors to visit a suspicious site in Iran. Once we've identified a site that raises suspicion, we will be watching it continuously until inspectors get in. And, and by the way, nuclear material isn't something you hide in the closet. It can leave a trace for years. But Israel's prime minister says the deal won't stop Iran's path to the bomb. The deal makes it far easier for Iran to build dozens, even hundreds of nuclear weapons in a little over a decade. President Obama disagrees. I do not doubt his sincerity, but I believe he is wrong. I believe the facts support this deal. Over at the Senate today, several hearings on the Iran deal and closed door briefings. The administration will have a very hard time enforcing uh, anything other than a massive violation. It's all part of the fast approaching congressional vote on the nuclear deal. That vote will take place next month. Since the, the deal was finalized, the president is meeting, has been meeting one on one and in small groups so far with 84 lawmakers. Brian? Jason Calvi at the White House tonight. Thanks, Jason. And now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Police near Nashville shoot and kill a man armed with a gun and a hatchet inside a movie theater. They say he attacked three people during a showing of Mad Max. All three had been doused with pepper spray. One had a cut to his shoulder after he was apparently hit with a hatchet. The suspect was shot and killed when he tried to leave through the theater's rear door. Malaysia's prime minister confirms part of a wing that washed up on an Indian Ocean island is from Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. It is the first piece of the missing jet to be found. It was discovered last week on the French island of Reunion. The plane en route from Malaysia to China disappeared nearly 17 months ago with 239 people on board. In a statement today, Malaysia Airlines expresses its deepest sorrow to the families and friends of the victims. Pope Francis calls for the church to be more welcoming to Catholics who are divorced and civilly remarried. The Holy Father reflecting on the family during his general audience today, his first since a summer break. The Pope says Catholics in this situation are still part of the church. Queste persone non sono affatto scomunicate. The Holy Father saying, these people are not excommunicated and are always part of the church. Francis did not specifically address the issue of Holy Communion for divorced and remarried Catholics. Alan Holdren attended today's general audience. He joins us from just outside St. Peter's Square. Alan, in what context did the Pope make his remarks? Well, Brian, this general audience comes just a couple of months ahead of the second installment of the Synod of the Family. It's a, a very important theme that he touched on uh, 
the people who are divorced and have a second union. Uh, this really took over media coverage in the first installment of the Senate. Uh, he, he directly uh, spoke of it today. And what did he say about children of divorce? He said that uh, the pastoral care, the care of the church for families, has to keep the, the child or the children of uh, people who have been divorced and in a second union at the center of their, the church's care. He said that they, uh, they should not feel further burdens because they are the ones who suffer the most from these broken marriages. And what was the Pope's tone? Was he encouraging or more chastising about this? Well, during the, uh, the general audience, uh, usually he just he reads the text. Every once in a while, he looks up. He looked up a couple of times, in particular, when he said that the, the church has to keep its doors open. The church has to be a mother to all. And he said, uh, he said twice, he repeated this emphatically, uh, the church cannot close its doors. It's, it cannot close its doors. He was adamant about that. At that point, uh, you, could, you could perceive that he was uh, not chastising, but, but trying, entreating people, imploring people. To, to keep the doors open to churches to all people. Good clarification. Alan Holdren from Rome. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Brian. And here in Washington, Dr. Matthew Bunsen joins us from Catholic Distance University. What was the Pope telling the church about these divorced and civilly remarried people? Yeah, well, the, the Pope was telling us two things. Uh, he was reiterating the church's teachings on the indissolubility of marriage. That's clear from his uh, obvious reference in his uh, general audience today about the fact that those who are divorced and remarried are, are committing a contradiction against the sacrament, the Christian sacrament, as he calls it. But then he's also reiterating the teachings of the the church, especially Catechism paragraph 1651, on the requirement of Catholics to be welcoming, to be open to the, those who are divorced and remarried. But he's also sp speaking, I think, to the divorced and remarried. He's telling them that they have an obligation to raise their children in the faith, to continue to be part of the faith. And, and I think he's also helping to create a certain amount of space for them uh, to develop spiritually, to try to find solutions in their own lives to what is a very irregular and difficult situation. But let's clarify, when he used the term they are not excommunicated, he's not talking about receiving communion. No, no. What he's, he's talking about is that uh, he's trying to clarify that the long-held misbelief that if you are divorced and remarried that you are excommunicated from the church. He's not referring to or in favor of giving communion uh, to those who are divorced and remarried. How does this fit with his wider themes of, of mercy and pastoral care? Yeah, well, he, as we have seen with Francis, uh, the media would have us believe that everything he said today is some extraordinary new development. What, what Francis is really doing, he, he quoted, again, the Catechism, paragraph 1651, but he also quoted Familiaris Consortio from St. John Paul II, exhorting the, the proper care of families. He quoted Pope Benedict XVI with uh, his own comment about what's called the, the wise pastoral accompaniment. Mm -hmm. So he's balancing on the one hand justice in the church, which he always talks about, with mercy and also compassion. So those are the, the themes that we've been talking about since the time of his election. Yeah, and we hear that papal continuity and all of that. Dr. Mackey, that Matthew Bunsen, thank you. Great to be with you. Good to have you. The Archdiocese of Minneapolis moves forward after charges of failing to protect children from clergy sex abuse. Archbishop John Neinstedt resigned in June. The Archdiocese filed bankruptcy as it works out settlements with victims. A judge recently sided with the Archdiocese to not extend a deadline for victims to file claims. Archbishop Bernard Hebda, the Apostolic Administrator for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, joining us from St. Paul. And why is the Archdiocese opposed to extending the deadline for victims to file claims? Brian, that's a, a great question. Actually, we're, we're already past that in that the, the court has already issued a decision, uh, certainly siding with the Archdiocese. And our opposition to extending the deadline was really based on the need uh, to move forward. In the whole process of reorganization, there's a give and take. And, we were certainly hoping that we would be able to enter into a new phase in this whole process. And that uh, deadline was really important for that, not just for the archdiocese, uh, but also for those who have claims against the archdiocese, so that we would be able to move on that relatively quickly. Now, as you look at the reorganization plan, does this include closing parishes? I, I certainly hope that that won't be the case, Brian. Uh, we're still very much in the process of formulating that plan. 
And so there's going to be a lot of work that's done over the next few months uh, involving uh, many different interests, attorneys from all parts, who together will be uh, helping us to formulate a plan uh, that is very uh, fair to those who have claims against the archdiocese, but that also allows us to continue that important ministry uh, that Christ has given to his church. So very briefly, how will you continue to serve the parishioners through this difficult time as well as move forward in the healing process with victims and their families? Yes, uh, fortunately, the Archdiocese already has some wonderful programs for outreach to victims and their families. We're certainly going to be continuing that. There's a wonderful uh, four or five day uh, retreat experience that's being offered later this month. There's a support group that's starting in September. All of those things I think are very important uh, for those who uh, have suffered abuse. We're also hoping that uh, it's going to be a moment of healing, not just for them, but also for the whole church that uh, certainly is, uh, finds it difficult at times to have the trust uh, that is so necessary. Yet we have to know that the Lord continues to work through his priests and through his church. Archbishop Bernard Hebda joining us from St. Paul. Your Excellency, thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Coming up, Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton spar over comments about the Planned Parenthood scandal. And Catherine Zeltner talks with the rector of Philadelphia's Cathedral Basilica about special relics. On Wednesday, the 5th of August, thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. The FBI is studying the security used to protect Hillary Clinton's private email system. Clinton's lawyer says the agency wants to make sure that emails were properly stored and secured. He says he and his client are actively cooperating with the investigation. Clinton's exclusive use of private email as Secretary of State and the security of sensitive information on her server has been under scrutiny since the setup was reported in March. Jeb Bush vows to cut off federal funding for Planned Parenthood if elected president. The Republican drew immediate fire from Democrats for comments made last night during an interview at the Southern Baptist Conference. You could take dollar for dollar, although I'm not sure we need a half a billion dollars for women's health issues, uh, but if you took dollar for dollar, there are many extraordinarily fine organizations, community health organizations that exist, federally sponsored community health organizations to provide quality care for women on a wide variety of health issues. Jeb Bush said, He's not sure we need half a billion dollars for women's health issues. I'm reading it because I want to quote it exactly. Now, he's got no problem giving billions of dollars away to super wealthy and powerful corporations, but I guess women's health just isn't a priority for him. In a later statement, Bush said he misspoke. He said Democrats and Republicans should defund Planned Parenthood and redirect the funds to other women's health organizations. There are so many Republican presidential candidates, they'll be split into two debates Thursday. Those polling in the top 10 take center stage during prime time. The seven remaining candidates face off in a separate debate earlier on Fox News. The network says it chose the 10 leading candidates based on recent national polls. The prime time debate in Cleveland, with its national exposure, could bolster some lagging campaigns. The seven serving as the warm-up act risk losing some donations and perhaps early endorsements. The Washington Examiner, Sarah Westwood, is joining us. Do you think this debate will begin to pare down the pack, or is that too early? Well, it will begin to be the first point where we start to see some of the front runners emerge and some of the weaker candidates fall by the wayside. It'll be the first time they have the chance to present their viewpoints to the American people in an organized format. In either of the debates, the warm-up or the real thing, what does a candidate need to do and what should they avoid tomorrow night? What a candidate needs to do is show that they bring something unique to the table that the other 16 don't bring. What they need to do is be tough, but avoid being aggressive and above all, avoid getting dragged into an ugly fight with Donald Trump because that's certainly something you might expect to see. And they need to avoid gaffes. I mean, Jeb Bush's comment on women's health care 
Do, do you see that as detracting from the Planned Parenthood debate? And uh, will it hurt him politically, what he said? I mean, it certainly attracts from the seriousness of the debate over the trafficking of materials when you're just parsing who said what. If he were in a general election, perhaps this would hurt him. But because he's in a Republican primary, I would argue he only hurt himself by not going far enough in his condemnation of Planned Parenthood. Hillary Clinton was quick to jump on that. Did he hand her some pretty good ammunition politically? He un unarguably did. I mean, what he said was basically perfect fodder for the message that Hillary Clinton is trying to get across, which is that Republicans don't care about women's health issues, which is, of course, not true. They just don't want taxpayer money to go to an organization that is so polarizing. Sarah Westwood from the Washington Examiner. We'll have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Sacred soothing sounds may help ease some of the concerns about how Philadelphia will accommodate huge crowds when Pope Francis visits next month. Choir practice has begun for the September 27th Papal Mass. The director says choir members know it is not a show, that they're engaging in the highest form of prayer. They're now rehearsing every week until that big day. It'll be really exciting to be to better ourselves as musicians, and it gives us a really great focus for the year. Um, and just to have the Pope here, and a Pope that's so well-loved right now by the people, I think will be so exciting. The Papal Choir will sing in several different languages. Pope Francis visits Washington and New York before going to Philadelphia. There he helps close the World Meeting of Families the last weekend of September. Philadelphia's Cathedral Basilica will display relics with connections to the World Meeting of Families. Catherine Zeltner is with the Basilica's rector at this week's Knights of Columbus Supreme Convention in Philly. Father Dennis Gill is the rector of the Cathedral Basilica of Saints Peter and Paul. Thank you for joining us. Father, what relics will be on display and what are you hoping pilgrims take away from this? Well, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. The cathedral will be a focal point, that is the cathedral in Philadelphia will be a focal point of the world meaning of families. And we want to encourage families to come to the cathedral all throughout the week, not only for the celebration of the sacred liturgy, but also to meet some of the saints especially the co-patrons of the World Meeting of Families, and that would be St. Gianna and Pope St. John Paul II. Mm. So we're hoping that having these saints who are of living memory for so many people who will come, it will inspire them in their own personal holiness and the holiness of their family lives. We also are going to have on hand the relics of the parents of St. Therese, mm. which are presently located in the Archdiocese of Philadelphia at the Carmel which is in the northern part of the city. Mm -hmm. And as another example of family life, holiness in family life, with the soon to be canonized parents of St. Therese, available as well for people's veneration and inspiration. And I understand St. Gianna's wedding dress will be on display. Why is she such an important saint for the world meeting of families? Well, she has a remarkable story. First of all, she's a, a modern saint and herself was a medical doctor, a well-educated Italian woman who made the choice to spare the life of her own child and give up her own life for her child. And you know, life in so many ways is threatened today. It's quite vulnerable and we have the issues of abortion and euthanasia, both ends of the spectrum of human life where the Christian message needs to be very loudly announced but not just by words, but by example. And so we have the example of St. Gianna. And she did this as a married woman, a wife and mother. Mm -hmm. And the wedding dress is a sign of that. And I think people will have great access to her by seeing her wedding dress. And it sounds like this will be such a spiritual journey for all those pilgrims. Father, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Up next, Chinese Christians try to stop the government from removing crosses from their churches. And cops and kids are mending fences on ball fields in one of Chicago's roughest neighborhoods. <laughs> Today, August 5th, is the memorial of the dedication of Rome's Basilica of St. Mary Major. Pope Francis prays there before and after each of his international trips. It's the oldest Western church dedicated to Our Lady. Thanks for joining us, I'm Brian Patrick. Ashley Nerona guides English language tours in Rome. And Ashley, are you seeing an increase in tourist traffic in Rome in general and the Vatican museums specifically? 
Indeed, Brian, there has been a great increase in traffic. Part of it is the Pope Francis effect. We've seen a lot more Spanish speakers, for example, in the city. And as well, the fact that the euro is much weaker right now. This is promoting travel from people throughout the world, especially Far East Asia. And what are these tourists most interested in seeing? They, of course, want to see all of the typical sites of Rome. There's the Colosseum, there's the Trevi Fountain, but no trip is, uh, is complete without the opportunity to see Pope Francis. And, of course, the hope is that a tourist can attend the Wednesday public audience or even come pray the Angelus on a Sunday in St. Peter's Square with the Holy Father. How many of them are Catholic? Well, the tourists that we have the opportunity to share Rome with, I would say at least more than 50% are Catholic. And they're looking to come to Rome for an authentic pilgrimage experience, to go deeper into their faith. But we also have the chance to share Rome with people of all faiths and of no faith. And it's an opportunity to clear up misconceptions about the Catholic Church as well. Ashley Nerona joining us from Rome. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Brian. And groups of Christians across China's Zhejiang province unite to oppose the removal of crosses from their church steeples. About a dozen Catholics wept and sang hymns as they watched the steel cross being cut off their church with a blowtorch. Parishioners earlier held a service inside the church in a last-ditch effort to preserve the cross. The removal of crosses from Christian churches is now a regular occurrence across that province. The cross symbolizes the cross that is in our hearts. The government coming and wanting to demolish is impossible for us to bear. Believing is what religion is. Have we ever opposed the government? Why do they not let us believe? They say we have religious freedom. Is this freedom? Have we violated any national laws? We are also good Chinese citizens. Last year, the provincial leadership ordered the raising of several churches and the removal of hundreds of rooftop crosses. The government deems them to be illegal structures. In Chicago's violence-ridden Englewood neighborhood, cops trade in uniforms for ball caps and jerseys teaching kids about baseball. They also hope to change the community's perceptions about the police. Wyatt Goolsby reports. The wind-up, pitch, and thump in a catcher's mitt. Welcome sights and sounds in a violence-plagued Chicago neighborhood accustomed to gunfire. All right, good eye, good eye. Many of these 9 to 12-year-old boys and girls initially had no interest in playing baseball. Let alone play baseball with the police officers out here. So most definitely it had to be a sales job there. Retired police officer Marco Johnson calls this one of his toughest cases, mending a frayed relationship between law enforcement and community. First thing they say is you're not like the rest of the police. And, uh, you know, I asked them, have you ever dealt with the rest of the police off duty or retired? And you know, most of them are dealing with police officers in the capacity of the police is answering the call, so forth and so on. Oftentimes, with guns drawn and flashing lights, shootings this year are up by a third in the police district covering the Anglewood neighborhood. There's been a lot of things going on in the news uh, with police, and my, my children have had to witness certain things. The Chicago Police Department set out to change that with the Anglewood Youth Police League. All of the coaches are current or retired police officers, something that surprised Dinah Edwards, a parent of two boys. And so when they got out there, they were like, these police are all around here. What are they doing? And I was like, oh, I guess they're going to stay. Some of these police officers might not seem like they're going to be nice, but then once you get to know them, they're really beautiful, nice. As the inaugural season winds down, it's been a winner by all accounts. And that's, that's my whole objective is to, you know, leave that positive impression that, you know, even when we're not on a baseball field, if they happen to see me, you know, on the street or drive by in a squad car or something like that, say, hey, coach, that's my coach. That makes a big difference. Police officers using the baseball diamond to polish a rough relationship and strike a chord with the community. Wyatt Goolsby, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Wyatt. What a great effort. Thank you. Until tomorrow, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For the EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night and God bless you.